I'm Tom Ray, and this is a bonus episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast for this season. Now, it's a bonus episode because it's actually not even an episode of this show. A few years back, I was actually on an episode of the podcast Radio Free Culture by Cheyenne Holman. It was for the WFMU radio in New Jersey. I was on it because from 2010 to 2018, I used to do a podcast that was called Music Manumit with a guy named Doug Whitfield. Music Manumit was a show all about free culture and creative commons and music. Cheyenne was in charge of the Free Music Archive, which at the time was run by WFMU. Free Music Archive was a site that was dedicated to Creative Commons music for film and videos. My band Lorenzo's Music was actually very active on this and also a very big supporter of remixable culture and Creative Commons. Now, I found this interview of Radio Free Culture the other day and I thought I would add it to this show just to show a little background on the option of Creative Commons music as an artistic license alongside of regular copyright. I know that Creative Commons is not something that is for everyone, but it's just a little insight about what it is and why I do it. Another thing we talk about is podcasting. So something that I think a lot of people should try just because it's such a great way to meet people and learn more about the things that you're interested in. This episode you're about to hear is a few years old, and I actually had to edit it because some of the sites and music, even, that we mention aren't even around anymore. They're no longer relevant. They don't exist. Um, the Free Music Ar Archive itself isn't even owned by the WFMU anymore. It's actually under construction right now. It was bought by another company, and they are actually working to make it something new. But uh, it is a fun episode, and it gives some background on my support of free and remix culture and art and music. So if you want to learn a little bit more about Creative Commons, you can go to creativecommons.org and check out what that's all about. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast, Tom Ray's Art Podcast, by going to tomraiswebsite.com or look for it on Spotify or wherever else you listen to podcasts. So anyway, here is my interview on Radio Free Culture from WFMU. Welcome to Radio Free Culture from WFMU, where we examine issues at the intersection of digital media and the arts. My name is Cheyenne Homan, and in this episode, we'll be talking with Tom Ray and Doug Whitfield, co-hosts of the Music Manumit podcast, we discuss Creative Commons and how it has caught on over the last few years. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, would you like to start by introducing yourself, since our listeners don't know your voices, probably, unless they've listened to your podcast before? I'm Tom Ray, one of the co-hosts of the Music Manumit podcast and the uh, singer and songwriter for the band Lorenzo's Music. And I'm Doug Whitfield, and I'm also one of the co-hosts, and I do so many things, it's not even worth having a list at this point. So <laughs> if any of them become relevant during the discussion, we can talk about them. Okay. So tell me about your podcast. How long have you been doing your podcast? That's a good question. Uh, it's Did we start back in 2011, Doug? No, it was 2010. It's been four and a half years, almost to Good the, Lord. almost to the day. Oh. So it's been minus a week. It's been four and a half years. We started it right before my birthday. No, no, no. Four and a half years. Oh, there you go. See, six There's... months away from your birthday. All right. That's what, one of the reasons I like to have Doug on is because he, uh, cause I remember shows me when I, cause he remembers, yeah, there you go. Cause he remembers <laughs> my birthday. Uh, Doug and I were members of various, uh, Linux user groups in town here and, uh, you know, different computer type groups in Madison back when he used to live here. He knew that I was a musician and I was also in, interested in creative commons and using that for my band and, you know, sharing music and stuff. And we got to talking and originally the idea started that he wanted to create an event, you know, showing musicians how to use creative commons and uh, getting other creative commons musicians involved. Problem is, is I think I was the only person in town here that was actively using it. So it didn't seem to be very relevant. And I, I was kind of dabbling in podcasting at the time with one with my band and two with just a personal project I did with a friend of mine where we just drink beer and listen to music and talk about it. 
And I suggested we do something that's more longstanding and something that we can keep going to go along with the different changes of Creative Commons and talk about using it in music. And I suggested a podcast and we started it from there. Yeah, there was this thing called Open Everything. And we were trying to branch out, not just in music, but in the thing was called Open Everything. So literally anything where anybody would basically be interested in openness. And Tom was like literally the only person that stepped up. Like we had other people that came and were like interested and seemed like they might do some stuff. But when it came to like pushing things forward and actually like taking the next step, everybody just started doing their own thing. So here we are. (laughs) Yeah. So you all were, you said you're like the only two people interested in creative commons music in the area. As far as we knew. And it's, we found from doing the show that that's not uncommon. We'll talk to bands that are very, very involved in it. And one of the questions that has stayed as a staple from our show is what's creative commons like in your area we try to ask or at least do you know any other creative commons musicians and you'd be surprised how many of them be like yeah i don't know i i I don't know of anyone they'll be the only one so it's not that uncommon which is very strange It, it depends too on what you define as the area so in milwaukee they have, I think it's mkepunk.net, maybe .com. But anyway, there's a whole catalog of Creative Commons punk and hard, hardcore musicians. Milwaukee has its own thing. But of course, Milwaukee is a lot bigger than Madison. So it's not shocking there's more Creative Commons musicians in yeah. Milwaukee than there is Madison. And, and it's changed, too. We have an interview coming up with band Lords of Trident that's in Madison in a couple months. So they're out there. We just maybe we'll find some more eventually. Sure. We will find you. <laughs> so, Doug, you've relocated, right? I've relocated multiple times. He's oh. a drifter. <laughs> Have you found uh, Creative Commons communities or groups of artists in the places that you've relocated to? Or have you really just connected with artists through your podcast? I was in uh, Concord, New Hampshire for law school. And I didn't try at all there. I just I didn't have time. And But now I'm in Baltimore. And there's actually just in the last couple of days, I started looking at, you know, who's in Baltimore. I I, I kind of asked around before and didn't get a lot of response. KG House is the one person that that's a stage name that, you know, was suggested to me. And so I talked about having him on the show, but he wasn't he's a creative commons musician, but he was like, well, I don't really want to do interviews. And we get that sometimes. It's not too often that we get that. But every once in a while we get that. What is your goal in doing the Music Manumit podcast? One of my goals, I would say, is I just like meeting other musicians. It's a good chance to do it. And I think with this being such a a kind of a niche, it sometimes isn't even really about creative commons to me. It's really about how bands are just trying to get out there and they're trying to use the new formats and the new ways of sharing music, owning their own their own uh, music. Uh, I just like discussing uh, things with them and learning things from them. We've had a bunch of people on that will turn me on to uh, different types of software, different types of websites to use, services that really support the type of thing we're thinking about. And that's that's kind of what I enjoy about it. I just I I just like meeting other musicians. And it's it's been cool. So the manifesto, I suppose, would be originally even though I was kind of understanding Creative Commons, I wanted to know more. If you listen back to one of our first couple of shows, I completely make a misstatement about what I understand Creative Commons and copyright to be completely. And our first guest even corrects me and like going, no, you got that wrong. And I'm like going, good. That's why I'm glad we're doing this because I want to know more about this. I want to build my knowledge from that and trying to let other musicians know that it's a way to share your music. It doesn't mean that you have to give your music away for free. It You can still monetize your music if you want to sell it, but there are ways that other people can use it. So that would be, that would be my reasoning behind it. So I'm, you know, interested in openness and sharing, you know, across the spectrum, not just in music, but both of my parents are professional musicians and I've been involved in music for a long time. I mean, I did a lot of sort of like event promotion in high school and in college. So, you know, when I moved out of Chapel Hill to go to Madison, you know, that was something that I wasn't really doing until Tom came up with the idea for the show. I wasn't really doing anything in music. So this was felt like the the perfect thing at the time. So do you all follow particular net labels or artists or like, where do you find people to interview on your podcast? I do all of the the scheduling. So 
Yeah. As long as, as long as it's a musician or a sound artist, you know, regardless of whether they call themselves a musician or not, I pretty much just pick whoever. Um, if we end up doing talking to somebody that is, you know, a service provider of some sort, you know, if it's somebody we haven't had on the show, then I'll I'll ask Tom and just make sure like is this something you think is relevant. I don't really think about do I like this artist or you know what sort of genre. I try to be as genre agnostic as possible just to make sure that we have a good variety. We'd be missing out on a lot if we did that. It's really just trying to find people in the realm. We're more interested about meeting them, not like going, oh, we can't possibly have that type of musician on. That's never anything that comes up in the conversation. It's really just more about people involved in the community. And if, you know, coming from where I'm at, I don't necessarily listen to stuff just because it's Creative Commons. I enjoy that that's a fact, but I also am just very much into what kind of music is created. There are artists in nearly every genre that have embraced it, but I feel that there's like a glut of solo noise artists in Creative Commons. It's just interesting to me that like I've never had anybody from a bluegrass band or... You know. So uh, Cletus Got Shot is the immediate name that comes to mind when I hear bluegrass and creative yeah. comments. However, they're on hiatus right now, So, but their recordings are still out there. Mm -hmm. um, I always found it funny, as far as electronic musicians go, most of the time, electronic musicians who will sometimes use sampled things or things like that will release their stuff under non-derivative, and I always find that very strange. Uh, it's not that uncommon to run into an electronic artist that doesn't want their stuff used with a derivative. Even though they're deriving from other exactly, <laughs> and I think that may be to a degree a misunderstanding of what that means. Yeah, a lot of folks it's, who want to use Creative Commons are really excited about the idea, but they're also very unaware of what they're actually allowing people to do with their work. Yeah, and that is that is exactly some of the conversation we have on the show with people saying they use their stuff under non-commercial because they don't want it to be used. And the example we usually get is something like you know uh, they don't want. Exxon. There you go. Everybody uses Exxon as the example, which I think is awesome, you know, because Exxon is just searching the free music archive, looking for music. Really, if you think about it and you put your stuff under Creative Commons, not using not using the non-commercial, they have to put their stuff, especially if you do share alike, they have to put their stuff under the same license. So how awesome would that be if Exxon did a commercial using their music and first of all, didn't do it under the same attributions like uh, license? And second, if they did, then you get to use what they did and you can do whatever the heck you want to their stuff and release that on top of it. I mean, it's the whole, it's the whole give and take. It's, it's kind of, I, I think that there's another layer there that I wish would happen so we could have somebody actually release something like that. Like, uh, if, if some conglomerate organization were to, uh, release something like that, and then here's the remixable of that. So we did have, uh, I think it was Nissan used some of Chris Zabriskie's stuff. I mean, oh, yeah. It, but they used it appropriately, if they did. I remember the story correctly. And he's also the one that had his music used in porn, right? He's one of them, yes. I mean, yeah. you don't think of that. Like, nobody uses that example. <laughs> but then he did. And I was like, come on, this has got to be the first time I've heard this. That was, that was pretty interesting. It's just one of those things that you don't think of. So, hey, kids, use your music under Creative Commons and this might happen to you. Yeah. You can join <laughs> the ranks of artists who've been used in pornographic film. Exactly. Um. Do you share your podcast under a Creative Commons license? Yes. We use the uh, attribution share alike. Cool. Do you all think copyright should be reformed or abolished or what? Like, what? what's your opinion? It's funny because I, I think it should be at the very least reformed. Internally, in my band even, they kind of let me make the decision with how we've gone this way. And, you know, I show them like, look at the benefits of, of releasing our stuff under Creative Commons. But it is still very much in inner struggle between the old ways and the new ways. And that's why I think there needs to be some sort of rediscussion of what copyright is. I mean, how will we ever get signed to a label if we do this? And it's like, well, is that really what you want to do these days? Would you not want to find somebody that does? And with the availability of your own self-distribution, why wouldn't you have your own predetermined sort of copyright involved. And, and there are lots of bands that did get signed who later on were like, this isn't for me. I don't like the, like, why did we aspire to do this? There's bands like, wasn't one of them, Doug, uh, Lewis Ling and the Bombs, I believe, oh. just went through a, a very similar thing. I think they even canceled one of our shows uh, because they kind of couldn't really put their stuff under attribution anymore or something like that. 
and then they they soon left the label. Yeah, they basically were in a situation where they they were trying to do what was right to help an organization, but that organization yeah. didn't understand the whole creative commons thing. Right. And I, basically my point is, is I think that even though the model on the internet and for releasing music, owning your own music and recording it a lot more easily, all the factors of music have changed. But for some reason, everybody still thinks that when it comes to making it, the old model is the way you have to go about it. Even though you can put your own stuff on Spotify, you can release, you can make your own label online if you wanted to and release stuff. You can distribute, you can put it on Amazon, you can put it on iTunes. There are much easier ways to do it yourself. I mean, it has come a long way. I've been, I've been trying to do this for many years and just how different it is these days. And that's why I think copyright needs to be revisited because everybody, when it comes down to it, it's like, oh, that's some big legal document that I'm assuming I understand. People won't want to work with you if you're if you're a Creative Commons musician, which very much so. But do you want to work with those people? Because there are other people that will. Have you run into people like that that are like, oh, Creative Commons isn't isn't a good option. It's not something you should do. Therefore, I'm not going to work with you. Not on the show. There have been some confusing emails that I've had back and forth of people going, well, I thought I could use this for free. And it's like, yeah, but then you have to use it in this similar manner because I put it under share alike. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to do that, which you can do. I mean, that's the other thing is if you want to talk directly with the artist, you can ask them if you want to use or if you can use their music in a commercial manner. All you have to do is talk to them. It's all completely owned by you. Also, there, you know, I mean, there's the whole factor that if people do misuse it, you have to kind of let them know, like, hey, this is how you do it. And there are realms out there to even take care of that for you. Like uh, Jimendo Pro or CC Mixture has CC Plus, which is how people can go and search for stuff that may not be under the license they want, but they can buy a license for it from the artist directly through that site. And you don't have to go through the legal mumbo jumbo. It just does it for you. So you don't have to deal with going back and forth and negotiating. They can pick like, I'm going to use this for a year in a documentary, or I'm going to use this unlimited for a commercial and they can buy the song and search for it. And both of those sites have actually a uh, pretty good searchable means of doing such a thing. Let's turn actually to you all and, and podcasting. I mean, you know, I do a podcast. I've been podcasting for a long time, but I'm curious about your experience. Like what's your favorite thing about doing a podcast and why do you keep doing it? I'm going to defer back to the meeting people. There'll be people where I'll look at it and I'm like, Oh, that kind of seems interesting. And there'll be one thing in the conversation where all of a sudden I'm like, Oh, I totally know what you're talking about. And it'll be something, whether it be a random tangent or whatever, and I'll make a connection with that person based on something completely different. It's just random. It's like meeting people at a bar. You find somebody that's interesting and all of a sudden you're like, Hey, I like that person. Not that I dislike anybody on the show. I like everybody we talk to on the show, but sometimes you just make a really cool connection and continue to build on that with a person. And I, and I think that that's probably the best part of doing it. It's really the main part behind wanting to do it all together. Even when I first started out before coming up with this idea and presenting it to Doug, I mean, that was me and my friend would, uh, he'd be over at my house and we'd be like drinking on a Thursday night or something. I don't remember. We'd be listening to music and I'm like, Hey, let's just turn on the computer and talk about the music we're listening to. Cause that's what we were doing anyway. So I started putting that out there. And I mean, it was completely illegal. We were listening to like mainstream stuff and <laughs> it was not, but, uh, and it was fun and I enjoyed it and I kind of wanted to keep doing that. But I wanted to meet the people uh, that were doing the music I was playing. And, and I think that that's what keeps me going as far as, as making it on the podcast. The only reason that we have continued to do it is because the things that we enjoy or at least can tolerate at the very least about <laughs> putting a, together a show are like they're complementary to each other. Like I, I hated, absolutely hated dealing with editing and I'm like really anal retentive about the scheduling. So I, I handle all of that. You, you got to like constantly remind people about this is when the show is and like stuff like that. It's, it's draining and I probably wouldn't be doing it if it was just me, but like, as like, oh, okay. When I think I'm like, okay, this really sucks. I hate doing this. Then I'm like, well, Tom has to edit the show and I hate that even more. So <laughs> as long as he's doing that, I'll keep doing this. And I hate scheduling and he does yeah. that. I mean, literally we do the parts that <laughs> both of us don't like to do. Well, it seems like a good working relationship then. <laughs> yeah, it, it actually works out really well. It's just funny the way that uh, we both care about different things. Do you all think that there are other podcasts that are doing similar things to what you're doing? 
I think podcasting has finally become something that people get. I think when podcasting was originally started, people didn't get it. There was, I, I, when I was listening originally, most of it was either you did a music show and it was kind of like a radio show where they'd play the song and then people would talk about it and then they'd play the next song. And that was, that was my first experience with podcasting. And then I discovered a podcast that isn't around anymore, but it was by a guy whose uh, name sounds fun and is spelled even more fun, Grant Biachoco. And he did a podcast that was kind of like those old drama, uh, old time radio things, only it was more of a kids based one. It was called the Radio Adventures of Dr. Floyd. And I enjoyed listening to it. One day I got, and I'm going to say that this was before people started making cartoons out of podcasts. I was like, hey, I want to make a cartoon out of one of your shows. And he was like, great. And he gave me a cartoon or uh, one of the episodes and I animated and gave it to him. And I think that that was really cool. I was just like, yeah, it's an audio thing. It's a, it's a, it's a clip. I'm totally getting to my point, I swear. And uh, people before they'd make fun of podcasting and like, oh, it's just somebody recording on a crappy desktop computer mic that and they just release it and it would be all crackly and their friends just, you know, talking about stuff that nobody cares about. Now it's its own medium, its own format. They've got uh, people have based networks around the podcast. More famous people have gotten involved in it to the point where other famous people make fun of them for doing it. Like Sarah Silverman had a party recently or a birthday party where the sign in front of the door said, I don't want to hear about your your stupid podcast and I'm not going to be on it was like the entry point at the door. But to the point that it's gotten where even celebrities are doing it. And I, I, I think that that's that's a good thing. I think it's worked pretty well for us. I don't know for a fact if we've had people go from non-derivative to, you know, to another license and then we've had them on the show. But we've had we've have had people change their licenses after, you know, talking about why we do what we do and how we do it. So, you know, having those conversations is important. And I will add, this is again, the yin and yang of me and Doug, because the way I heard the question and I get when Doug answered, it's like, oh yeah, that's probably what you meant too. I see it more of a, of a infotainment thing. And kind of, if people are doing that sort of podcast and, and Doug keeps it true to the creative commons thing, because he, I mean, while I care about it, he is very enthusiastic about it and, and likes to keep it on task with that. So that's, that's really interesting that you got two different answers on that. Whereas I think people are kind of doing shows like this where they interview different people and backgrounds and it's more like a discussion that you just have with different artists and people in the same, same realm as you. And I think it's cool that you both had a different take on it. Like I didn't, I don't think either of the answers was wrong. Would you encourage listeners to make their own podcasts? I mean, how much work is it? Like, I know how much work it is, obviously, because I make podcasts. Right. But like, what, what would you recommend if somebody is thinking like, oh, I'd like to do this? Like, what should they know? Doing it regularly. There's a thing that when podcasting first started called pod fading, where people would create a podcast and then they would just go, oh, I'll do I'll do one next week. And then you'd look and see and like they hadn't they'd release one and it was there's like three months in between. So if you're going to if you're just doing it for fun, go right ahead. I mean, there's no reason. It's just like music. Release it online whenever you want. You know, that's that's great. But if you actually are going to create a following and want to build something off of it, then you need to be regular with Doug doing the scheduling and stuff. There are many times where like I could totally be like, yeah, sure, we won't do it that week. But uh, we'll still discuss back and forth and try and keep each other motivated to to do the show. And I think that's the most important thing. We were originally entertaining the idea of doing a bi-weekly show. But once we started doing interviews, there just is such a backlog of people that we want to talk to that. I mean, we are having conversations where we're scheduling time for people in March already. Uh, uh, no, we're just, scheduling September already. Good Lord. See, that's that's what I'm talking about. It's amazing. So if you if you stick with it, I, I mean, definitely do it. And if you just want to do it for fun, do it for fun. I don't see why anybody shouldn't start one. It's a great learning tool as well. I mean, I would say that I know a lot more about editing audio or even just trying to orchestrate a conversation in audio just by doing that. Like me, I just ranted for like five minutes. I couldn't have done this like a year ago. I don't even know what I'm talking about anymore. <laughs> and it's entertainment. <laughs> so, but yeah, I think, I think anybody should, I don't see why not. It's the internet. That's what it's there for. Yeah. I mean, I think just going in with the right expectation about what you're going to do. I mean, if you don't take the time to do some editing and like have a good mic, which my mic is not working, but um, <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, yeah, it's pretty ironic. So, nor normally my mic sounds a lot better on the show. You know, you, you got to take some time to do those sorts of things. But the flip side of that is if like literally all you want to do is talk into a microphone and release that. That's super easy to do. Talking to your 
phone yeah. and click upload and you're done when like when you're done talking. So I've done some of that just to sort of like, you know, see what the reaction is and stuff. And there is a um, a market for that kind of stuff. But you've got to be interesting. <laughs> We're pretty much like we are on the show. I mean, I get on the microphone and just start talking to people. I, I, I would think uh, if you listen to maybe one or two shows, you kind of get the idea of, of what we're all about. If yeah. you just throw audio up on the internet, nobody's going to be able to find it. Even if it's the most amazing show ever, it's going to take a long time for people to figure out that it's the most amazing show ever. Cause somebody has got to be like, well, I have no idea what this is. Let me click on it and see if it's great. So yeah. you've got, you've got to have some text so people can find it. I don't know why, but I just all of a sudden imagined us having an interview with like Santa Claus and not putting any notes on it. <laughs> And then, you know, and nobody would see it. And we have this amazing interview with Santa Claus. And he's talking. Okay, never mind. I'm sorry. That's good, though. I like your own <laughs> dynamic. I think it's fun. Yeah, so that's all the questions that I had for you, actually. I don't know if you have anything else you'd like to add. Going back to what you had asked about earlier, about mm-hmm. whether people should do podcasts and stuff like that. One of the uh, bits of information we got was from a uh, fellow podcaster and musician that we interviewed on the show once who talked about when he first started doing podcasts, uh, Dan Lynch, he originally used to toil over the editing process and it used to go back and forth between him and his partner that he did the show with. And he finally said, you know what? He realized that it just was better to just chop off the ends and just keep the conversation the way it is unedited. And that's really the way I've done it too. I'll take out some stuff like when I, you know, when I screw up or the computer crashes yeah, of course you don't want to keep that in there yeah and if there's <laughs> like you know the levels are I mean, it's fairly easily i mean depending on how bad they're off but you just had a lot of dropped. distortion so yeah. <laughs> if you edit that part out yeah <laughs> i was just gonna say that i was like or when your voice drops in the conversation you cut out that part and connect it somewhere else i was happy to be on this yeah, yeah thanks a lot for having us absolutely yeah it's been great talking to you guys Radio Free Culture is produced by WFMU and the Free Music Archive, and is supported in part by a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. Our theme song this week is The Spider-Man's Nano Loop by Uncle Bibby, and can be found at freemusicarchive.org. For more information about the Music Manumit podcast, please visit musicmanumit.com. 